Um, this is the book of Philippians. And uh, I, I'm excited. I really am excited about what God has in store for us. Um, it's a uh, there's so much to this book historically and spiritually um, that you think in four chapters, oh, we'll be done in four weeks. We won't. <laughs> Not by a long shot. So, um, but I, you know, I, I know we, we, we really pick it apart, but I, I, there's so much. I don't want us to miss out on, on all that God has for us um, uh, in, in his word. And one of the main themes in this book is, is that of joy. Um, and joy is huge um, and, and in, in every aspect of it, and we'll see it play itself out. But it's, it's, joy is one of those things that, that I think as, as we just handle really poorly, let's put it that way. Joy is one of those words that we, we sort of push over to be trivial. You know, it's, it's not one of those big things. It's a trivial thing. It's, it's something that, oh, it's, I want to use the word frivolous. It's, it's something that's nice to have and have a good time, but it's not really essential where biblically that's not the picture i mean it makes up one third of the kingdom of god he says my kingdom my kingdom is righteousness peace and joy it's it's a third of his kingdom it's the second in his list of when he when when it talks about the he, um the holy spirit the gifts of the holy spirit and we all know that the holy spirit is the spirit of christ and so what is his fruit that he he, he gives his fruit is is the nature of Christ. So he, he's pouring out the nature of Christ in us. And the nature of Christ is love, joy. joy. It, it, yeah, there's a whole list, but the joy is number two there. Mm. And so, so, so we, we, as we navigate this in the Bible, we realize Jesus, he, he made that statement and he says, I've come to give you joy, that your joy can, may be full and complete. So if he's like, I've come to give you joy, you realize maybe we're missing the point here. Maybe there's more to understanding than just what the world or we've come to box joy into. And so my heart is that we have a, we, we, God will birth a new understanding of joy and the importance of joy um, in our lives and, and from his perspective. I mean, we all know that Nehemiah, what's it, 810, um, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's, it's one of the things that we know, but, but, and we can all quote it, but, but, but we want the strength and don't really pay much attention to the joy side when we quote that verse. It's not the joy of the Lord over my strength. And joy doesn't really sort of hit our face. It's, it's normally the, the, please Jesus, I need your strength. And, and yet it's the source that, that's really important. Um, and so I really, that, that's my heart is as we unpack this, I, since the beginning, in the middle of last year, Megs and I, it, it just kept coming up that, that God had joy on his heart and, and, and asked for us to unpack joy. So that's what we are going to try and do over the next however many weeks. Not promising what that, how many ever weeks is, you know that. Um, so that's the journey into, into Philippians. And somebody said to me, can you be too joyful? And according to God's joy, no. We all need more joy. <clears throat> Because joy is a cornerstone of what, what God gives us. In fact, scripturally, joy is the anesthesia to get through the hard times of life. It's not taking it away. It's not, not caring about it. But it's, that's the joy is the strength of the Lord. The joy is that which, that, that's what he gives us to navigate life. And if we're poo-pooing joy, maybe that's a challenge of why some of those things really feel acutely alone or sore or whatever those things are because we're not navigating what God has given us through joy. So, so we all need more joy um, and to experience the fullness. In fact, you know, I, I gave the NIV version. I've got the other version put in my thing. But Psalms, Proverbs 17, 22, it says, A cheerful heart is good medicine. Another one that we, we, we quote often. But it's not just a glib proverb. It's real. It, it, joy, cheerfulness, God's joy is medicine. And maybe all of us need a prescription refilled. <laughs> maybe we've run a little bit low on this. And, and scientifically, joy, there's a, in Proverbs um, 15, 30, it talks about the joy and its source is good for the bones. But we, we, if you do, if you read studies, they found that, that real joy, contentment, not fake joy, but real joy brings a good immune system brings it actually affects you physically mm -hmm. um, and so so there, there is a lot of benefits and importance um, in in joy and 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 navigating um, the, the, the concept the biblical concept of joy and so another comment that often comes up when we're dealing with joy is going yeah but you just don't I can't have joy because you just don't understand where I'm at or what I'm going through or what my situation is and I love the way God <laughs> knows his children so well so he goes fine I will address the biggest topic, the biggest way that joy is in the biggest place that joy is addressed in scripture, Philippians. Where is it addressed from? 
prison. Paul is writing from prison. And it's not our sanitary little prisons. It's horrific. He has been beaten and bruised and he, he is chained to, as he's writing, he's chained to a Roman soldier and the, 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 the squalor and the, the, the stuff that he's living in is, is horrific and I won't do that to our tummies today. We'll unpack the Roman prison another day. But, but the reality is, it is from the deepest, darkest place that this joy is, is poured out. And I think that's important for us to see. It, God's not going, it's not a platitude. Oh, you need some joy and suck it up and have joy. God's like, no, no. There, there, there is a joy that can well up from your deepest, darkest place. Um, that is for you in your deepest, darkest place and can, can come through you because that's, that's the picture with Paul. He was in it. He encountered joy. He was living joy, but it also poured out in effect. And we're bearing the blessing of, of that being poured out. Um, so so that, that joy being poured out in his prison cell. And it's amazing. Paul never saw himself as a, vict a victim. <laughs> and let's, if, you, if you sort of read through his history, he, he really was. He was always in the wars. He was always either in prison or being beaten or shipwrecked. And the poor man was always up some creek that, that, that wasn't very pleasant. But he never considered him a victor, victim. In fact, his, his thing was uh, he lives in, in, the, in the victory of joy. And that, that was his, his premise, that that's where he lived from. Uh, he lived from the victory of joy um, and not as a victim. And, and so I think we have a lot to learn um, from, from Paul. Um, and joy is a huge topic in scripture. Um, in, in the, in the, the narr narrative of scripture, joy, uh, gladness, which is the derivative of the same word in, in Hebrew and Greek, and the other word that we've really Christianized, rejoice. Um, I, you know, when I say rejoice, I think half of us don't even relate that to joy. But it's, rejoice means taking joy and living it to the full. So when I rejoice in the Lord, I find my joy in Him and I pour it out on Him. That's what rejoice means. So, so right throughout scripture, there's the words joy and gladness and, and rejoice or rejoicing. And it appears 840 times in scripture. It's an important theme. Joy is something that God going, hey guys, this is important um, and we need it. Um, so so it, it, it's, his heart for us is not to live depressed or, 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 or broken or in worry or in anxiety. His heart for us is to live in joy. And to not the world's joy, but his joy, and to encounter that. And so uh, we are going to, to look at that and we're going to discover where joy is found in the book, how it comes to us, and how to maintain it and how Sorry, to give it away. Course. No. This was me about 50 Go for it. Um, so so it's, it's this, we, we'll see throughout Philippians the process of joy. Um, how, where do we find it? Uh, how does it come to us? How do we maintain it? And then how do we give it away? Um, because and we know this, with God, he always gives us stuff to bless us, but also to be a blessing. Um, it's always for our good, for his glory, and for the redemption of the world. That's, that's the narrative of everything God does. Um, and we'll see that with joy as well. So let's look at Philippians. Philippians, as we said, it was written by a prisoner in prison. And from that narrative, it is the most, it's the book where joy is referred to the most. It's 19 times in these little four, four little chapters. He refers to joy um, in, 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 the, in the thing. Um, and it's, it's amazing because we see that, I don't know if we'd know this narrative about joy if he wasn't in prison. Think about it. If he didn't end up in prison, we, we wouldn't have this wellspring about joy. And so even that, there's this thing of going, God, where I am, even the darkest places, what do you want to use it for? Maybe my darkest place, it can be the well of, of where I encountered the, the greatest well of joy in me and that you can use through me and to touch others. And so there's this perspective change that happens in Philippians that's, that's really amazing and that we're going to unpack it um, as we go along. Um, so as, as we go into this, let's be honest, um, <laughs> we get to live, as, as people of faith, we, live in, we are meant to be living in triumphant joy, but we all live with joy stealers. We all, all know what those things are. Um, or they're, they're things that come into our day and we, we get up and we're filled with joy. And by 9.30, joy has left the building. <laughs> we, we all have those. We have the, the joy stealers. And, and we, we need to identify those things because not to, to sort of give them attention in the sense of letting them get us down. But, but 
I have, the, the, I have triumph and joy because I'm in Christ. And yes, the joy sealers come into my day. But I need to be able to take that and hold it up in the light of God's grace. In the light of who he is. In the light of what he's done. Which is what Paul did. And so when I do that, actually it, it can't keep me down for long. It, it's, it's, that, it's that anything that I hold up in the light of God is going to come off immeasurably short. I, I remember a Sunday school teacher said to me, Everything, no matter how big that thing is, what is the worst thing that's happening to you at your, in your day, in your situation, in your family? What is that thing that's happening? And they said, like, everything in relation to God is God is this great big God, and nothing can be bigger than a pea next to him. Even your, your biggest problems, your, your biggest anxieties, your, your, the things causing you the greatest stress in your life, the things you're most afraid of, in relation, when we hold it up thanks to God, it really is really not even worth the mention and so it's really good for us to have that perspective change because let's be honest when we live in this world some of those things can overwhelm us and I mean think about poor Paul he's in jail and it was overwhelming I'm not even going to go into the smell being overwhelming because that's a whole different level of a Roman jail but the, the, everything about it was overwhelming and yet he was able to in that dark place hold it up in the light of who God was in the light of God's grace and go hang on really in the bigger scheme of things I can have joy, not that, not denying the stuff, but in reality, this is my reality, and this is what I get to live from. Um, and so, so it's it's that perspective that, that we get to, and, and, and acknowledging Jesus' love and His grace, and realizing that that's what I get to do life from, and with, and through. Um, so nothing keeps him down very long. Um, in, in Psalm 30, verse 5, I think it's in your notes, it says, we all know that, we all know that thing is, weeping may last for a night, but... Joy comes in the morning. It, 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 God's like, and he's, the, the scripture that says, my mercies are new every morning. And that's why in the light of morning, I can hold up the stuff to God and go, actually, in light of God, his mercies are enough. I get to live with this, his faithfulness. Um, great in his faithfulness. And, and I get to live by that. So, so it's not denying the weeping. But that doesn't need to be the place that we may camp. It doesn't need to be the place that we stay and that... Um, denotes our life that, that that becomes our identifier that's not who i am it's what i go through that's why in psalm 23 it's like we, we pass through the valley of the shadow we don't make camp there it's real it happens but but the process that god does is he takes us through it and so it's it's, it's that acknowledging again of going this is not my reality my reality is is him and i get to walk through him okay so Philippians, the book of Philippians, Paul was written, obviously, by Paul. And it's funny enough, people, theologians, let's be honest. One thing about a theologian is they love to argue about everything. Um, <laughs> everybody has their own opinion of everything. But this is the one book that they don't argue that Paul wrote. So, yay. <laughs> we know definitively Paul wrote Philippians. Um, Paul's life, do you remember he had went on those missionary journeys? Mm. He went on three missionary journeys. For those of you who did Sunday school, this reminds me, I can see those, still see those uh, maps on, on the Sunday school class. <laughs> Didn't quite know what was ever happening in those, but I saw them. Um, and so he went on three missionary journeys, and they weren't like a quick holiday for three months. They were years. Like, it wasn't easy to move around in those days. Within those three missionary journeys, he was in jail constantly he was forever uh, in, in being beaten and th so that there was this whole period of things so that basically took place the first journey started in the late 40s but but predominantly Paul's main ministry happened between AD 53 and he, he died around AD 62 so that that's where the majority of what Paul writes and does happens at the beginning of the second missionary journey he gets, I've given it to you at the back of your notes, is, is Act 16. Act 16 is how this Philippian church starts. He's minding his business and God wakes him up in the middle of the night with a supernatural encounter. And there's a man by his bed saying, get up. He said he identifies himself as the man from Macedonia. Get up and come and help us. And Paul wakes up and goes, okay, we've got to go to Macedonia. Um, and that's the beginning of the second missionary journey. And he, it was the first place, Philippi was the first place that, that he ever went to on, on sort of the, the European continent. He, he, he was in the Turkey side of things um, when this was all happening. So then he, he set sail from Turkey, modern day Turkey. I'm using modern day language just so you can picture it. Philippi is in modern day Greece. Um, so he, he gets on and he goes. Um, and that, that, was, that was when this... this um, the book of Philippians, the, sorry, the church of Philippi was started. He gets there, um, and you can go and read it, but it's interesting because now he's got this man who's calling him and says, come, come and help us. 
And, and when he gets there, he looks around Philippi and he, he, he sits outside the gate and he starts talking to the women. And there's this woman who starts listening. Interesting enough, firstly, she's a woman. Secondly, she's, she's a Gentile. She's, she's completely not of their faith. She's a wealthy woman. She imports and exports and she trades in purple cloth, which was incredibly expensive, the dyeing and trading of purple cloth. And she starts listening and she's a lady of means and she's a lady of, of influence. And she says, actually, I want what you have. And her name was Lydia. Um, and that was where, so the first convert in Philippi was Lydia. Mm. The second was also a girl. There was slave trafficking and these slave traffickers had got a young girl who was demon possessed. And when the demons possessed her, she could tell the fortune. She could tell people's future. She was a fortune teller. And that's how they made their money off her. And for the first couple of weeks that Paul and Silas were around there, she went after them shouting, you, they, they are from the most high. They are the way you need to follow them, which none of it was wrong, but clearly it just really irritated Paul and was, <laughs> was disturbing everything. So eventually after weeks, he turns around and he casts the demon out, which this is where it all, all went to pot because suddenly they're like, you've taken away our bread and butter. So they drag him off and they, it starts a riot and they beat these guys to smithereens. They take him and the jailer has to lock him in. They talk about in the bowels of the jail so that no one else can get to him and, and them. And they, 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 they put them in stocks and they, they try and they look bloodied and whatever. And they, that's where they lock them up in Philippi. Um, and then from there, uh, we, you may know the rest of the story. In this horrible place, being misunderstood, beaten up, Paul and Silas start to, to worship God. Okay, don't get caught up in the situation that they're in. Um, and they're like, you know what? God's got this. We're here because he's, he wants us here. And I don't think we understand the prison in those days. They were in stocks. But th everything that happened, happened in community. All the other prisoners were there. They were all chained together. They saw what was happening. They, they, they encountered. So, so there was a, a, an audience to all of us. And Paul and Silas were, were just, well, you know what? We're going to praise God. And they praised God. Anybody know what happened next? Open. Why? This one, the Bible tells us why the chains fell off and the doors opened. Earthquake. Ironic, much after yesterday, but yeah, there was an earthquake and the doors fly open, chains fall off, but it's in the middle of the night. And again, we forget, maybe we South Africa have a better understanding slightly, but load shedding, where all the lights go off and you cannot see your hand in front of your face. Remember they were in the bowels of this, this prison. There's no windows, there's no lights. And the, the Roman prisoner runs, the, the Roman guard runs in and he's like about to kill himself. Why? He is responsible for the things. He said, obviously, the prisoners have now run away. So that the punishment would have been my family and his family and him would have been killed. That they were responsible for things. So he's like, I'm going to take my life. Um, and Paul and Silas go, no, no, no. Hang on, dude, we're still here. Um, and, and then this Macedonian soldier stands up and says, we need you. Can you come to my home? And, and, and there's that man that appeared to Paul at his bed um, and he goes and he leads the whole family to the Lord and whatever so that that's the we'll unpack that later but that's the, that's the start of this church what we're reading now the book of Philippi is one of the last things he wrote so we're looking at between 59 and 62 he's old he's in prison in Rome now and he's writing back to a church that he went to often and um, that he loved and and the history just a little bit of a history for, for, for Philippi, is that wasn't its name. Its name was Crenitus. That was the name of, of, of the little town, Crenitus. But what happened there was a huge Roman um, battle took place at Crenitus with Alexander the Great. And they had, Rome had this incredible victory. And so as, as a celebration of this great victory, Crenitus was given royal Roman um, status um, and it became the it place in the Roman Empire in fact historically it was the place where all the generals and the lardidas and the fancies are from Rome would retire so it's this is going to be important as to know who they are addressing in a moment when we, we unpack this so and what they did was to honor dear old Alexander the Great because of his great victory at Crenitus they said well we're going to name it after your father who was Philip of Macedon Macedonia because this was Philippi is in the area of Macedonia. So his father had been King Philip of Macedon, and so they called it the city of Philip, which is Philippi. Um, but the original name is Crenitus, which means... Spell that for us, please. I can find my page where I have it. Um, K-R-E-N-I-D-S. N-I-D-S. Thank you so much. 
Um, and it means wells. Wells. It was called the place of overflowing wells. Um, so even that, this place of where joy would bubble up from is a place of wells. But just so a little bit of history. So, so the people, you, what will help you when we study the Philippi, book of Philippians is knowing that the book of Philippians is basically a thank you letter. It, it's a long thank you, longish thank you letter, but it's a thank you letter. He's thanking them for their support, particularly their financial support, because they were very good to him. But, and they were, because of their history, the church in Philippi, again, remember who they are? Most of them retired or out of decommissioned Roman soldiers, Roman legions, the, 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 the legion leaders, they were the, 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 the big guys in, 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 in Rome who now retired. Yeah, they retired. And so they had a real good understanding of what it meant to serve, to, to be under leadership. Yeah. So, so the, the concept of church worked really well with this group because they understood this coming under authority. They understood generosity. And, and they, because they were wealthy, they were a very wealthy bunch, they were very good to Paul. They, they really supported him a lot financially. But the one problem, and you'll see it was one of the themes of the, the Philippi, Philippian book, is that the, the problem, which was an atypical problem for the Romans, was pride. They, they, were, they could serve, they were great, they were generous, but the, the, the stumbling block tended to be pride because we're Romans <laughs> and we're the best and whatever. So, so just a little bit of history because he'll, he'll address some of these things as we go. Any questions? Sorry for all the history, but it, sometimes it helps better for us to ground it. Um, okay, any questions? Are we good? Okay, so I want us to go, we're gonna look at um, themes, the themes that we're gonna look at. Um, so, so the historical themes, but I want to look at the spiritual themes in the book of Philippians. Obviously, number one, the first theme is that of joy. 19 times mentioned in, in, in the book, and, and we're going to unpack that as we go. Another major theme in Philippians is the mind and our thoughts. Now, interestingly enough, these themes are all really closely linked because joy, whether we like it or not, is a choice. Yeah. And so it's, it's navigating this theme of joy goes, hey, joy starts here. And so we know in Philippians 4, 8, I think it's in your notes as well, he, that verse we all know very well where he says where we've got to choose to think on these things, that which is pure and lovely and excellent and praiseworthy. It's, it's a choice. It's, it's, it's me choosing in my head these things. And it's so interesting, biblically, who's, we, we have, there's our head our, and our heart. Who's, whose responsibility is what? Whose responsibility is our heart? Your head. Biblically, the Bible says, God says, you manage your head and I'll manage your heart. Because when we manage our head, it affects our heart. When I start choosing to, to, to choose joy and choose love and, and they, they head decisions in our understanding, it starts to affect our heart. And then what happens? From our head, it, it goes from our head to our heart. And what's the outworking of that? Faith. To our mouth. Yeah. Remember scripture, and in some way, I don't know if I got that verse, um, Luke 6.45, where it talks about whatever, from the overflow of your heart, speaks the your, mouth. your mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. So it's this thing of God, go, the theme here is, hey, this is important. There's a knock-on effect here. I want you to have joy, but it starts with you, and it starts with, what, starts with this. And in scripture, taking control of our mind. God has given us what we need. He says, I'll give you the mind of Christ. I will give you my spirit of wisdom and spirit of revelation and all those things that you need. But... It's yours to manage. You've got to choose. You've got to manage your thoughts. And as you do that, it will affect your heart. And as you do that, it will affect what comes out of your mouth. So when I manage, how do I, how, what is the outworking of joy? Well, it starts in me taking my thoughts captive and managing my thoughts, which all of us are great at doing. <coughs> Not. Uh, <laughs> let's be honest. It's one of those that, that yeah. It's not an easy one. We will never unpack that. It's a challenge. It is a challenge. Um, and, yet, and yet the Holy Spirit is in us and he says, hey, when, when you allow me to work in you, my fruit is joy. Um, I'm here to help you with this. But there is a partnership that, that we need to work at. So for the main theme, so we have the theme of joy going into the theme of our mind and our thoughts. Um, 
And, and in the, just the book of Philippians, 15 times, um, um, mind and thinking is played out 15 times. And, and, and so we see it's, it's, again, quite a big um, theme in, in Philippians. Um, and again, you know, that process, when you think of what it affects and alleviates, when I get my mind and my thinking right and my heart and my speech, it affects our anxiety. It, it, it affects our despair and our hopelessness. The, the knock-on effect is huge. And, and suddenly we realize, oh, okay, God, we, 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 maybe we understand why, why joy is such an important part in this and, and our thoughts and that. Um, I'm just, this is really just the glibbing over each thing. We, we're going to unpack it as we go. But does that make sense so far? Yes. We're good? Okay. Um, okay. And, and obviously there's still hard things and there's things that, that we go through, but that we get to go through it with joy. Not because we don't care or not we, we're not a part of it, but because, because of joy, because of what we stand in God, it doesn't knock us down. We're able to get up, dust ourselves off, and carry on. Um, and, and that is spiritual growth. Somebody goes, oh, you know, I've messed up again. And, and then what, we, what do we do? Our natural reaction is to sit in the dirt and go, well, I've messed up. And why am I going to bother? Where God goes, the biggest picture of, of, of spiritual growth and, and tending yourself spiritually is getting up, dusting yourself off, and going on. Um, and when we've done repentance, remember that the, in God's eyes, Repentance, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's important for us to remember. Sometimes we think repentance is dust myself off. Now I'm starting at the bottom and I have to climb all the way back up to where I was with God. That's not biblical repentance. That's maybe how we expect repentance from people, but that's not biblical repentance. Repentance with God is the minute we repent, we're back into the full position we were with God. There's none of this grovel stuff. Because God's going, no. I've, this is the work that Christ's done. You don't get to do this because we feel justified by groveling and God's like, no, no, you're justified by the cross. Does that make sense? So when we repent, when we turn, we get up and dust ourselves off and go, no, I'm choosing joy today. Do you understand that is victory? That is, that is moving on in God. That's taking ground in the kingdom. Okay. That's, I'm going to get carried away because I really love this topic, but we're just going on. The next main theme, obviously related. So we've got joy, we've got the mind. What is our source? Where is that the source of joy? Christ. Yeah, so the other big massive theme, obviously, in Philippians is Christ. And you'll see it impact I mean, in absolutely everything. Jesus Christ, 40 times in the book of Philippians is, is mentioned, but it's, it is the essence and the source of everything. Um, and so we'll unpack um, the sovereignty and the greatness of Jesus. The other theme is a good Sunday school word, sanctification. Let, let's take a step back. What's justification? In Sunday school, we, have, we learned that there's justification and there's sanctification. Let's just get the vacations right. <laughs> <laughs> justification, what as, is that? Just as if I had never sinned. Perfect Sunday school answer. Well done. <laughs> it is. So justification is the, the, the act of being saved is I receive by faith what God says is done, and I am saved. And so it's everything that Jesus does. It's, it's God take Jesus removing my junk, and I'm getting the fullness of his righteousness. So when God looks at me, I am saved. I am righteous. I am exactly everything that I need to be by faith. Yes? The work is finished. When I said to Jesus, yes, I'm done and dusted. I am the fullness of, of who he called me to be, and I've got the fullness of what he's, he won for me. I don't earn, I, I don't get what Jesus has done for me incrementally. It's there. My cupboard is full. Yeah. Sanctification is, it is finished, but I am not. So it's that picture that we, we said with the, the waif, where, where the little pauper street kid is taken in by the king, and the king says, I'm adopting you. You now have my name, you have my authority, you have my bank balance, um, you, you, you have my kitchen, or whatever else. Um, and he, he is instantly royalty. He instantly has his authority. He instantly has riches. But now let's, we know enough about street children to know that, that they are going to need to learn to live with that reality. Because they're still going to hold everything here. They're going to trust no one. They're going to hide. They're not going to... Do you understand the concept? And so their, their reality is finished. They, they've got a new reality. There's a change. It's done. But now they have to learn to live out in the fullness of that reality. That's what sanctification is. Jesus has done that full work for us, but now I need to learn. My cupboard is full with everything he's won for me, but now I need to learn to unpack my cupboard and live from my cupboard. I can't go, I have no peace. And God, Jesus is like, no, no, peace is in the cupboard. Take it out. Use it. 
Does that make sense? Yes. So sanctification is taking that stuff and working out. So that is a theme in, in Philippians. It's that, yes, you are my, you, the, the Philippian church, you, you, yes, you're Christians. But now you need to learn to, to let that affect you till you look like Jesus. That's the act of sanctification, is, is that transforming us to look like Jesus. Amen. That's, that's, the, the, that's the process. Yeah, everybody good? So yeah. Philippians 1.6, you, 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 you should probably all know this one by heart, but um, it speaks of that where it says, I pray with great faith for you because I'm fully convinced that the one who began the gracious good work in you will faithfully continue the process, this process of sanctification, of maturing you until the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of the, the, the versions we know is until um, Jesus comes, it, it, ironically, it's the same word as revelation. So it's not when he comes necessarily physically, but when he is revealed in us. So Jesus is going, I remember the process is to look like Jesus. So he says, I'm not going to stop this work on you and to work with you in sanctification until you unveil Jesus, until you look like Jesus. It's that uh, burning the dross thing, where, you know, where you burn um, gold or silver and, and you, you burn all the dross off and you scrape it off. And I know when it's pure, when the, 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 the master can look into it and he can see his face. That, that's that act of sanctification again. It's a case of Jesus working in me until he, he sees and the world sees Jesus. Enjoy, Amanda. Okay. So that was the, the, the theme of, of sanctification. Um, so, so there is this, this beautiful place um, that we get to navigate um, with God in the process of 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 the sanctification of of it being a fool but the, the this unveiling of jesus is something that's not where's the word i'm looking for it's not passive sanctification is not well i'm going to wait till it happens to me it's something that i need to do with god i don't need to it's not work for that i earn but it's work for that that i take hold of does that make sense it's mine, but I need to, to, to like, it's, it, I, I, I may have all the riches in the world, but if I'm not going to draw it out of my bank account, I'm still going to live like a pauper. Does that make sense? So, so there's, it's not passivity, but it's a relationship of passion. And that comes through very strongly um, in Philippians. Right. The next one is the, the, the theme of humility. And as I said, there, there's a reason a lot of that, a lot of attention is given to humility. And basically he goes, Humility is a theme because you can't do sanctification without humility. I, you can't, if you're not humble, you're not going to be take correction from God going, hey, that, I need to knock this little bit off you here because that doesn't look like Jesus. I, I, we, we need to stop that there because that, that, that doesn't look like Jesus. And if, if I'm not humble to the work of sanctification, I'm going to battle. If I'm not humble to the truth of who God is, I'm not going to encounter the joy. Because I'm going to stand by, no, all I see is rubbish, so that's what it is. That's where my pride is going to get me to stand. And I'm going to miss out on the joy, because I don't have humility. Does it make? Yeah? Does it make sense where humility fits into that? And so there, there's this beautiful thing that Jesus does, shows, and it's, it's portrayed in the second chapter of, which is the beautiful poem in Philippians that we'll get to. But it's, it's the poem of the self emptying love of Jesus. If anybody could show us humility, it was Jesus. He gave up his seat in the, his throne and everything and came as man. And so the, the way Jesus portrayed humility and love was it was self-emptying. And that's what we're called to, of, 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 of laying down self and picking up God. So Philippians, is, as I said, is... is, 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 is the picture of Philippians is the, the process of um, a thank you letter. But in this thank you letter, what is your remembrance of teaching again, Sunday school or sermons? How is Paul normally portrayed? Paul is a person. How is he normally portrayed? Is he kind, gentle? How is he normally? When, when the pastor speaks to you about fiery. him, or you're teaching him, what? Quite fiery. Fiery, yes. Yeah, a a hot-head, a chauvinist, a passionate. passionate, yes. yes. But he often comes across as very alpha male. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just like I like a bull in a china shop, like you know, and, and not really about getting the job done, not really about the faffing other stuff. Now. 
there were tendencies of that in the beginning when Paul started. Remember, please, can we just have a little bit of grace for Paul here? <laughs> it's like, I don't want to be judged by who I was 25 years ago. I don't know about anybody else, but, but I am not. Praise Jesus, who I was 25 years ago. Hopefully in a couple of years time, I'll be very different again. But... Paul, who, who we get at the road of Damascus when he was this arrogant guy that God first saved, is not who we find in this part of his life. In fact, he's the complete opposite. He is seen as the carrier of joy. Again, not how he would have been portrayed in the beginning. And he's intimate. There's, there's, you, you find that he's soft and he's, he's approachable and he's, he's got a heart for the people. And, and when you read Philippians, you'll see he's heart in it. I, I think I just gave you what Philippians 1.8 um, in your notes. But the language that he uses is just, you know, it's, it's not that alpha male, rah, rah, rah. It's God knows how much I love you and long for you with tender compassion of Jesus. That, that's not a... Raw, raw man. He, so, so he, 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 is, he, he has changed. Jesus has changed his life. And he is now a man of compassion and a man that carries joy. And a man that looks more like Jesus. He has been involved in this. Even Daryl Paul had to go through that act of sanctification. As do we all. Right. Are we all good? Yeah. Okay. So what I want to do now is just, there are, in each chapter, there is an outline and there's a, a line for each chapter. And I really, if you can write these lines down, because I, I think they're really important. They summarize each chapter as we go. And I just want to give you the outline for each chapter. Um, chapter one, it's joy in living for Christ with confidence. Christ is my life. Say it again, please. Joy in living for Christ with confidence. Christ is my life. So, so it's it's this there's this picture of of the first part is is, is living in a confidence that is not in me. It's what we're talking about at the beginning. That's not in the world. In fact, it's that Psalm two verse eight. I think I put it in your notes that God sits in the heavens and laughs. <laughs> we sit on earth and panic. Like, 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 that's the reality here. And he goes, hang on. The, our joy is living in Christ and in the confidence of, 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 of who he is. Nothing, you know, with all of this craziness in the world, and we've been praying lots for Syria and, and for Turkey and for all of these things that's going on in the world and for um, Russia and Ukraine and all of that. And, and it takes us off God. It does. It catches us off God. It swipes our feet from under us and we, we, we can hit panic. And God's going, hang on. But it didn't take me off by God. Off God. Don't hear me wrong. Not that he caused it. Not that he did it. But it didn't take him off God. He is still on the throne. He is still sovereign. He, and again, it's a big God in relation to what it is. And yes, it's drastic and it's horrible. But in relation to who he is, it isn't surmountable. And so it's this, this place where I get to place myself of going, yes, I navigate this and I need to pray into it and I need to be part of it and I need to care for it, but I don't need it to, to determine me because I live in the confidence of him. My joy is living in Christ and in the confidence of him and therefore he is my life. We use that word history and the, one of the best things that my teachers ever taught me was history is his story and history is not just past. History is the entirety of the story. It's the, the past and the future till it's finished. And I am part of his story. So no matter whatever happens in the world, we need to understand it's not outside of his story. It's outside of mine, granted. But it's never outside of his. Do I understand it? Do I have questions? Sure, all of that stuff. But when it comes to where I choose to plant my life and live from, my joy is in him. He's got it. He's sovereign. I don't need to understand it. It's like climbing onto your dad's lap and the world's falling apart and not knowing what is going on. But when dad puts his arms around you, I'm good. That's the picture. My life is Christ. So I get to live in this world. And that's that you've heard me say the statement before. We get to live from victory, not for victory. He's my victory. He, he's victorious over everything. He, he's done it. So I live from this place. Does those things impact me? Yes. But again, I hold them up to him and realize, okay, hang on. My confidence is in you. I don't understand everything, but I'm going to live from, from this, your truth, from who you are, and know that you've got it. Does that make sense? 
So the first chapter we look at, at him being our confidence and that he's our life. That's where we live from. He's our source. The next line, chapter two, is joy in serving Christ in unity. Unity is a big theme, a big thing that comes up in, in, um, in, in this book. So it's joy in serving Christ in unity. Christ, my model. So the first one was joy in living for Christ with confidence. Christ, my life. This one is joy in serving Christ in unity. Christ, my model. And again, he calls us to unity, and there's a lot, you'll learn, we'll do it next week, that, that, that he really calls us to radical unity, that I don't think we understand in this book. In prepping chapter one, I was very uncomfortable, it was really challenging, um, in the unity God calls us to, but he goes, hang on now, this unity that I'm calling to you, it's in me, and again, real unity can only be done with humility. Humbly loving people with God's love. Do I always like people? No. Do they, can they offend me? Yes. And what do I have to do? Forgive. Humbly let go, forgive, and, and, and live from that place of unity in Christ. Um, and so, so there's this challenge that we'll be challenged with. So it, number two is joy in serving with unity. Christ, and Christ is the ultimate model of that. Let's be honest. Um, and so humility listens. Um, it walks together. It blends. It's... it's it's beautiful. Okay, chapter three. Joy in knowing Christ experientially. Not just knowing the facts of Christ, but knowing him experientially. In Philippians 3.10, Paul, Paul writes about Jesus, Oh, that you would know him. And know him, that know is an experiential know. It's not a, that word in Greek is not a, a, a cognitive no, it's an experiential no. Because knowing something by effect doesn't really change my life. I, I, when, I, when I used to talk with teens, I always used to say, it's, a difference, it's, it's, a, it's the thing of being the difference between loving and being in love. I can love someone and that doesn't affect my life. I love Nelson Mandela, didn't really know him. Love Nelson Mandela, did he affect my life? Not really. I love my brother, to be fair. And most times that didn't really affect my life. You know, he, he'd come home, I love him dearly. He'd come home from school and go, can you make me lunch? And I'm like, what's wrong with you? Make your own jolly lunch. Um, love him, but not in love with him. Was engaged, my, my fiance used to come back and go, sure, I'm something like, what can I make you? How can I make it? I was just exhausted. I'd also worked all day, but I didn't care. I, I was in love with him and I wanted to, to, to go the extra mile and it affected me experientially. And it showed experientially. And that's the difference. That, that's, that's, when, when they talk about experiential love or passionate love, that's what the difference is. Loving, just loving something from afar doesn't change me and doesn't change the way I am. <coughs> experiential love, passionate love does. Does that make sense? So this is the, the kind of love that, that we're going to see modeled out to us. It's, it's passionate love. I was reading um, from Psalm um, this week, and I just love the beginning of it. Psalm 18 starts, Lord, I passionately love you. I want to embrace you, for, for you've become my power. I, and it just, it, that's the picture of God. I, it's, it's a life that I passionately do in you and with you and through you. You know, the, 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 the scripture says that, that in him we live and move and have our bring. That's the picture. It's not just knowing something about him and trying to tick off a tick list. That becomes really hard work. That's legalism. And Jesus says, that's what the Pharisees had, and I don't want that. I want you to, to come and fall in love with me. Love me deeply, passionately. And then humility and not taking offense and all of those other things, and living in joy becomes a whole lot easier because I'm, I'm not trying from my strength, but I'm drawing from his passion. Yeah? Um, so that, that one is... Um, there was that three, yes. No, knowing Christ experientially, Christ is my goal, was the last bit of that one. Christ is my goal. Uh, number four. Uh, this is number four. Now that was just the, that was the last caveat of, of three. Um, number four is joy in resting. And this is an interesting one, and I can't wait to unpack that. Joy in resting in Christ with peace. Scripturally, you can't have joy without peace and peace without joy. It's an interesting dynamic scripturally, and we'll unpack that. Um, and rest in that in that deal. So the joy in resting in Christ with peace. Christ, 
my contentment. He is my contentment, my satisfaction. Joy in resting in Christ. With peace. Christ, my contentment. Those are four big lines. But, but do you see how full they are? And, and, and if that is the joy that we get to live in, when the, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength, and he goes, this is the joy of the Lord, then we understand when I'm finding my goal and my contentment and my, and, and my life and my model in Christ, then I can handle the things that I need. Yeah? Okay, we, we're going to wrap up um, in just a minute. Any questions before I just finish off the last piece? Just a comment. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to the the earthquake and everything, and I don't know if anybody else heard that there were seven prisoners in the middle of that earthquake, and the the, the prison jail broke open, and they were looking for these South African prisoners. And immediately, <laughs> oh my gosh. It's in Turkey and earthquakes and Paul and <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they were also singing songs to God. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you, you never know. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> okay, these are just a few little comments in closing. Just just I want to throw them out there. Um, number one is that joy is not, because this is something that most people say to me and I in love, sometimes when I tell people I smash their heads against the wall. Um, <laughs> because people go, no, I, I'm just, I don't have that personality. I, I, I'm not a gregarious person. I, 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 I'm more, you know, the calmer, melancholy. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just quieter. I don't have a bubbly personality. I'm a, that is nonsense. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the God who created you, created you for joy. He created your personality. Get that. But your personality was created for joy. Maybe your personality needs joy. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but, but there's this, we were created, remember, we are created to be like Jesus. The second thing is love, joy. We are created to carry his joy. That's the vessel we have. And maybe some of us rattle around in our vessel because we haven't found what it's actually supposed to carry. The, 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 the attributes and the character of God. And so it's got nothing to do with age. That's another one. <laughs> the lady said to me the other day, no, I can't do joy. I'm too old. I'm like, actually, some of the most joyful people I know are in their 90s. So that's nonsense. It's not about age. It's not about generation. It's not about personality. It's about Jesus. Um, and and the, the joy that Jesus gives is like nothing else. And so please don't let that, that be something. And why I'm saying that is sometimes when these things come to your mind, this is not judgment for myself because they are things that I battle with. But even the concept of what our understanding was of joy and all those things. In, as we go along this process, don't just try and push the two together in your head of going, I have this dodgy concept of what joy is and of who I am or whatever. And then there's what Mel's saying or what God is trying to teach us. Sometimes we need to, when these things come up, actually put them on the table and go, God, hang on. I, I clearly have a dodgy understanding of joy. Will you help me unpack that or lay it down? Will you teach me something new? God, I, I clearly have a wrong idea of who even I am, if I think I can't have joy. Will you show me who I am? Do, do, do you know what I'm saying? Enter into this with God. That, that's why I'm throwing this stuff out here. We, we, want, we want all that God has for us. But that always is co-laboring. I, I need to, to be able to, to bring those things to the table as well. Um, now, secondly, joy, this, this, this fountain of joy, Scripture says one of the main places it comes from is His Word. In, I gave you the, the thing, Psalm 19.8 says, His teachings make us joyful and radiate with light. We want joy, but then we need to get into God's word. And the next part of that is we need to be walking with His Spirit because the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits is joy. So, so to do this, I, God's like, you can't do this on your own. It's just like in Romans 5.5, 5, He says, God says, I'll give you my love. Philippians is going, I'll give you my joy. But if you're going to do my joy, then you need to do it my way. And where to receive it is from my Spirit. And from our word. Um, that thing of Nehemiah 8, 10, where it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Sometimes, again, we try and see that as our joy and conjure up joy. And, and that doesn't work. We all know that. Like, it, it doesn't work. It's God's joy. Who is God's joy? Scripture. 
Think about this. Yeah. Jesus. This is my, my son who I'm well pleased. I, the one I, have, I, have, I find joy in. So the joy of the Lord. So it means Jesus. Who's the joy of the Lord? The joy of the Lord is Jesus. It's about us living in the fullness of Jesus. That's our strength in life. It's not a conjured up joy. It's not like, let's laugh at it. That's not necessarily what it's saying. It's, it's about actually t- taking on Jesus and all that he is and all that he's done for us. Um, the other thing, let's be honest, joy can be lost through sin and, and, and compromise. And we've all been there. Sin and compromise has got in the way. And you know what? We don't even realize it. And, and David was like that. David had, remember, he compromised and all the sin with, with, with Bathsheba and he had an affair and then he had her husband murdered and then he had the baby by her. And the just and we find him sitting on his throne grumpy. Fair enough, newborn babies and stuff may be but I don't really think it impacted the king. Um, but, but he was grumpy. And Nathan the prophet goes to him. God says, go and talk to him. And he says, my king, do you know why you're so miserable? And he tells him, he says, you've compromised. Thing. You've lost your joy. And in, in Psalm, I think I put it in your, your verse, in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is David's confession and cry out, plead to the Lord after Nathan has, has pointed it out. And I, I in, uh, I think it's towards the back, is it? Yeah, at the bottom of the second last page, it says, um, Psalm 51, 12, let my passion for life be restored, tasting joy in every breakthrough you bring to me. Hold me close with you with, uh, with a willing spirit that obeys whatever you say. He's saying, I need that my joy to be restored. And so maybe some of us, if we're battling with joy, need to go, God, is there anything that I've compromised in? Is there junk that I need to clear? Not for condemnation's sake, not for guilt. There's no condemnation in Jesus. But God's like, put it on the table. Let's just deal with it. Confess it. Wipe it off. Get it out the way like David did. And let's move on. Come back into that passionate, intimate relationship with me and receive all that I have for you. Um, The other thing is, what do you think are the three greatest thieves to joy in our lives? Yep, can be. The three greatest thieves to joy. Uh, Time, neglect. Compromise. Compromise. Yeah, those are things that steal it from us. But but the thieves that 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 come in and 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 twist it. Number one is difficult circumstances. Difficult mm-hmm. circumstances, and we lose our joy. The other one is difficult people. <laughs> and the third one is worry. Mm-hmm. Anxiety and worry is a thief to our joy. Mm-hmm. And we need again. God's on a process, and we're going to, that's probably my last point now, but, but the point is that, that all of this is, I'm going, okay, God, as we start this journey through Philippians, I want to process this with you, because joy is not a flip, a switch that you flip. It's like, Jean, you don't like you have joy, so I'm going to flip a switch, and now you're going to be full of joy. That's not what we're talking about in Scripture. It's about God building and, and putting those things into place that is something that is life-changing. I want us to get to the end of the Philippians and be completely different to who we were at the beginning. Not for a day, not for a moment, but for a lifetime. Because we have the more of the character of Jesus in us. And able to navigate the, the life that we live in, the world that we live in differently. Does that make sense? And so I, this is an invitation. As we end off today, I want to invite you to a process with God. To unpack his joy, and maybe unpack mine into the bin. But, but do, do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's this thing of, of opening up and, and, and letting go of some of the things that we need to let go of, of working through things, of, of learning things, and repacking things into our lives of, of what is true, and building our lives firmly on the joy that the Lord has for us. Does that make sense? Yes. Are we good for this journey in the process? Yes. Anything else before we close in prayer? Biblically, what what is the word? Does anybody know the word that it biblically is our word for happiness? The word that translated biblically is, is happiness. Yeah. Bless. So remember the beatitudes, blessed are the whatever that are the actual English translation for that word bless is happiness. Happy are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. Happy are that. So often when the word we see the word bless, that's our English word happiness. Joy is something way bigger and way deeper. But 
just lost them. Always, uh, we, I had a Sunday school teacher that used to teach us and she said, joy is something that God gives you that you never lose, but it, it very seldom sees your face. I want to disagree with half that statement. It is something that is deep, that, that thing when it's there, nothing can shake. But it needs to get a point where it changes here. It changes the way I live, it changes what my face does. Because what's the point of joy, of, of, of joy when I still have worry and concern and misery and depression on my face? That's not it. Because the whole point of joy is we receive it so that we can give it. Because what the world needs, really, is God's joy. They don't have that. There is no worldly derivative for joy. There's a worldly derivative to happiness, but not joy. Cool. We good? Yes. Brenda, will you close up and pray for us, please?